few to settle down this part of it and we will be ready to start in a while. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to each one of you to the Tech Phoenix Satyam's 100-day turnaround story. I'd like to begin by inviting all our panelists to the stage. Uh, may I begin with requesting Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, Deputy Chairman of the Planning, former Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of India, Mr. Kiran Karnik, a prominent Indian administrator, chiefly known for his work in the broadcasting and outsourcing industries, former Director General NASCOM, Mr. Deepak Parik, an Indian businessman and a chairman of the Housing Development Finance Corporation. <laughs> Mr. Tarun Das, corporate executive writer and a former chief mentor of the Confederation of Indian Industry. Mr. Shardul Shroff, Indian corporate lawyer. He's the executive chairman of the law firm Shardul Amarchand Mangaldas. And of course, the authors, Mr. T. Manoharan and Mr. V. Pathabi Ram. Mr. Manoharan is a chartered accountant, former president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, and the ex-chairman of the Canara Bank and the fourth largest public sector bank in India. Mr. Ram is an author, public speaker, and teacher, besides being a chartered accountant. He has taught over 75,000 chartered accountant students and is a regular speaker at the professional seminar circuits. For the publisher's address, I would now like to invite Ms. Yamini Chaudhary, Senior Commissioning Editor, Rupa Publications, to address us, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you to the launch of Tech Phoenix by Mr. Manoharan and Mr. Pattabhiram. It is indeed uh, an honor and a privilege for me to share this stage with very distinguished luminaries from both government and the corporate world. I'd like to add here that of the seven uh, guests on stage, four have been published by Rupa. And I hope we shall have the privilege of publishing the other three very shortly. I've been asked to deliver the publisher's address. But uh, I'm also very proud to be the commissioning editor of Tech Phoenix. Uh, for those of you not very well versed with the publishing jargon, a commissioning editor is the person who is the first point of contact for all authors. We normally reach out to authors and request them to write on a certain subject. At times, authors may also write to us with a request to publish their manuscripts. But in the case of Tech, Tech Phoenix, nothing of that sort happened. What actually happened was that I reached out to Mr. Patabi Ram with a request to write a book on the great NPA's mess. He wrote back uh, with a synopsis and his CV. The last line of that CV was very interesting. It read, completed a book on the Satyam scam and awaiting publication. So without any further ado, I wrote to Mr. Patabi with a request for uh, 
a couple of chapters, which of course he did send me. And when I read them, three things uh, struck me. The first was uh, the sheer sweep of the narrative. Uh, from the time uh, Ramalinga Raju wrote the letter to the uh, acquisition by Tech Mahindra, it had all aspects covered. The second was really uh, the clarity and simplicity. There was no jargon written very uh, in, in a very comprehensive but very narrative style. But most important, what I felt was this book isn't about only the Satyam scam. It's really a book about hope. It's about survival about sincerity and sheer strategic brilliance. There was also a very, very interesting insider's perspective, which was beyond all the hyperbolic headlines about why the scam happened, will Satyam survive, etc., etc. And uh, all credit to both the authors for giving us that perspective. For instance, there is a 20-point SWOT analysis which I'm sure all of you will find very interesting. But I wouldn't like to give out any further details. I would urge each one of you to pick up a copy from outside and read this story of hope and survival. Uh, I would now like to hand over to uh, our guests, our panelists, and hope that we all enjoy the very intriguing discussion that will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yamini. Uh, before we launch this much acclaimed book, let me share a short clip about the Tech Phoenix. Can we have the video, please? With that, friends, it's now time to launch the book. May I request our dignitaries on the days to untie the ribbon and release the book. The books are lying in front of you. Request you all to hold it up for a photo op as well. And now we come to the interesting part of this afternoon, the panel discussion. And for that, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to invite Mr. Sandeep Bamzai, MD, CEO, and Editor-in-Chief, IANS, our moderator for this discussion, to join the panelists on the dais. Over to you, Mr. Bamzai. The mic and the panelists are all yours to take forward. Thank you. Frauds. One of the biggest corporate frauds in uh, Indian corporate history uh, emerged out of a 
name or a derivative of truth, Satya. And Satya led to Satyam. And the biggest corporate fraud in our lives, at least in mine, uh, I've been a media person for the last 40 years. Uh, in terms of corporate fraud, I don't think there's, thing, there's been anything bigger. Obviously, uh, there's Harshad Mehta and Ketan Parekh and XYZ, but those are securities market scams. This was uh, an iconic moment uh, when we woke up uh, that morning and uh, the owner self-professed, claimed that uh, he'd done all sorts of jiggery pokery and he couldn't get off the tiger which he was riding. Uh, it was open season after that, but truth to tell, the way the government of that time handled this crisis and the immediacy with which it worked on allaying the fares of uh, not just the work, people who worked there, but more, more importantly, uh, reputational damage to an entity like Satyam, which was part of the big four, along you know, with Infosys, TCS, Wipro. I think globally the message that went out was that this wound needs to be cauterized and it needs to be done immediately. And I think uh, this long and distinguished panel will, uh, will obviously be telling you uh, how the dynamics of how and when and why uh, everything uh, happened. But uh, from my prism as I view it, I think uh, that government uh, under uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh needs to be complimented. Uh, Anand Mahindra needs to be complimented for stepping in as a strategic investor and saving uh, the day as it were, bacon, saving the bacon as it were in this case, because uh, uh, for a long time Indians were viewed as coolies internationally. And I think uh, what Indian tech uh, managed to do is overall that uh, imagery that existed overseas. And from coolies we became techies uh, Satyam then changed that perception all over again, that here is an owner who's claiming himself that he indulged in corporate fraud. And there were 50 odd thousand employees, and there were contracts with leading global behemoths. All that had to be uh, neutralized, all that had to be done uh, post haste, and I think uh, Mr. Parekh, Mr. Das, uh, Mr. Aluwalia, Mr. Karnik, and of course, Mr. Manoharan and Mr. Shroff, all of them played their part. So uh, I won't take too much of your time. I, straight off the bat, I'm going to start asking questions to the panelists. Uh, I would prefer that the panelists sit where they are, uh, because if everybody was to get up, then it would create more chaos. Uh, everybody has a mic in front of them. Yeah, yeah. I'll pose questions, and you can answer them. Yeah. I think I'll start with uh, Dr. Aluwalia because he was uh, then a part of the government. Uh, and I think he will be able to tell us what exactly transpired on the other side. Uh, because when the crisis broke, Mr. Aluwalia, what was the immediate reaction from within the government? You were the deputy chairman of the planning commission. You were a key member of the cabinet. So what was the immediate reaction and what, what was the agenda? How quickly would you have wanted to address it and uh, the reputational damage, as I said, needed to be cauterized. So what, what exactly did you do? Yeah, um, no, that's, uh, you know, can I depart from your instructions that we sit down <laughs> here? Because my chair is in the process of collapsing. Oh. <laughs> so if you allow no, me to please, go there, please, then they please, can please, discreetly please, remove please, please, and please, substitute please, it, right? Please, please, okay. please, please. I will also request all the panelists to keep it short so that I can get in more questions and we can have more dialogue. OK, well, thank you very much, Sandeep. Thank you. And I apologize for what may look like a blatant sort of disobedience. You know, my, my role in this was at only at a very early stage. I mean, I think when I re read this book, the first thing I'd like to say is to congratulate the two authors, the terrific job that they've done. And quite honestly, uh, uh, the, they both said that they've only sort of said what they know about. So it's a little bit reminds me of uh, Kurosawa's Rashomon, where 
you know, the incidents are all factually known, but different people tell it differently. So I have only one little advantage, and that is that I was involved before this stellar board was constructed. And, you know, it was very clear, not just to me, but to one or two other people also, that this was going to be an incredible event just about, and by the way, at a very critical time. I mean, this happened just after the terror attacks and so on. Uh, India was all over the news, uh, the Taj Hotel and this and that. Apart from that, there was a, a global financial crisis. People were wondering what's going to happen to these developing economies. And, you know, we were very aware that uh, one way or the other, there'd be enormous bad news. So I had the opportunity to talk to Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh very early. And the main thing that I said, and I have a feeling that I had actually talked to Tarun Das uh, separately, and thus got a sense from him on what are the problems uh, that we need to be careful about. And I said that, look, um, the reputational damage to the IT industry would be incalculable if we didn't handle it well. I mean, that's rather, I mean, it's an obvious point, but it was important to put it across. The second, which is more, uh, which is more uh, controversial, is the instinctive reaction of government was that these fellows are all crooks and we must get rid of them and we must put our own board. And putting our own board would usually have meant a set of government servants. I was convinced that this would be an unmitigated disaster. Not because the government servants are incompetent, but a government servant has always got to observe whatever the rules are by which he's going to be charged. And in this environment, the dominant concern would be not, did you save the company? Did you somehow protect the interests of the IT industry? The dominant concern would, did you get all the crooks? Did anyone get away? And that's a legitimate issue, but it's not the most important issue for the next week. So what I had suggested, and I, I can't fully remember, but I think Tarun had a very big role in persuading me that this was the right reaction, was to tell, suggest to the Prime Minister that you have to change the board and don't have a single government servant on it. Just bring in the private sector. And then we discussed and Deepak's name came up, uh, Kiran's name came up, but we didn't get into the details. Let's just decide that is not going to be taken over by a bunch of civil servants. We're going to put the government is taking responsibility and putting a bunch of distinguished private sector people on the board. And I was very pleased that he actually agreed with that. And uh, of course, the book tells it like the authors saw it, that the somebody from the Ministry of Corporate Affairs called up and said, you have to be on the board. But behind the scenes, the decision was that the Prime Minister informed the minister concerned, Mr. Gupta, I think, that we're fixing this. You are not supposed to decide who's on the board. That's being done. And your guys will be informed and they will convey. And of course, you know, I, I had suggested that Deepak's name, and he was well known, uh, to the PM, and I said to the PM that, you know, he said, yeah, why don't you call him and ask him? I said, look, I'm willing to call him and ask him, but frankly, uh, you should call him yourself. And he did that. So uh, Deepak might very easily have uh, found uh, 50,000 reasons to say no to me, but he was uh, quite generous and agreed when the PM asked him. Frankly, after that, my role, by the nature of the thing, we weren't doing any backseat driving. And I think all these gentlemen uh, would verify that certainly for me, they didn't get any calls. I said, look, you've got the right guys there. They'll find the right thing to do, and they'll do it. And I must say, the book brings that out extremely well. You know, I fact, in fact, I said to Mr. Manoran that I really hope that uh, one of the institutes of management uh, makes this into a case study. Uh, and I think there are lots and lots of excellent lessons to be learned from it. You know, one of the interesting things is really that, in a way, it should be made into a film also. Because remember, the Hashad Mehta thing was made into a film. 
So quite frankly, I mean, Rupa, where's Yamini? She's somewhere here. Yeah, You should sell to Netflix the idea of making it into a film. Because, you know, uh, Raju, uh, this is not just a crook who took over a company. He's actually a very skilled, imaginative guy. Uh, and did lots and lots of very good things and also some incredibly ridiculous things, criminal things, okay? The other very interesting thing is that what motivated him to make this astounding disclosure to shareholders, which amounted to saying, dear shareholders, I'm sorry to tell you, but we've been cheating all this while. Now, you know, that is film worthy. It is not really business case worthy. And there's a lot of uh, human decision making that must have gone into it. So I, I think it's a great book. Uh, please read it. Uh, one of the nice things in the book, the chapter at the end, uh, all these uh, lessons that are learned, they really need to be internalized not just by people who are going to run companies, but also by civil servants who have to interact with business. Because he makes a point very powerfully that, you know, you, when something goes wrong, uh, there's the approach that we must fix it so that this particular mistake never happens. But you know, there's type one error and there's type two error. So generally, if you try to minimize type one error, you maximize type two errors. And how do you balance that when you're in government is actually a very sophisticated act of whatever probabilistic analysis. And we don't, we don't, we're not trained to do it. And we actually therefore never do. So these are just some preliminary thoughts. I'm really delighted that uh, this initial uh, effort on the part of the government proved to be such an outstanding success, principally because the government played an incredibly limited role in structuring the success. Very crucial role. But after the first structuring, it really stopped doing that. So thank you very much for asking me. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I'm going to sit there because that's a bit risky. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll cut to uh, Mr. Parekh now because uh, Mr. Parekh, I think you need a microphone. So uh, when you actually got into the guts of uh, the issue, the entire issue of skullduggery on Ramalinga Raju's part, what was uh, your first take and what was the corporate strategy that you thought of trying to revive this company or trying to turn it around or basically trying to save it initially and then of course looking at what else could be done later? No, it was India's reputation at stake. We are the global IT back office of the world and software and we had to somehow save this company and uh, as soon as possible. So. You know, you see the latest uh, Olympic mot motto. It, it always had faster, stronger, higher. They've changed the motto and added together. And our objective was to work together with the six members and try and find a solution ASAP. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had some issues. Uh, what were the main things we looked at? One was clients. Uh -huh. Clients were petrified. We were scared they would leave us. And all our friends in the other IT companies had started approaching our clients poaching. and poaching our people and clients. And they're all friends of all of us, but <clears throat> it didn't matter. Uh, when this happens, people are grabbing business. So we had to call most of the clients. We had to call them at night because they were mostly American customers and give them assurance that the same people will handle your job and you please relax give us a few weeks. Same time, we had to meet the staff, the executives, and give them confidence that your salaries, which have not been paid, will be paid. And we will turn it around, and you have to stick to your job, and we will find a good owner of it. And uh, so we had to bring confidence, and we had to bring confidence to the clients. Then the third C was cash. There was no cash in the, in the company. In fact, the taxi driver, the car hire company who fetched us from the airport, first thing when I sat in said, che se paisa nahi mila hai. So, you know, there was absolutely no cash in the company. So fortunately, with the help of the government, an IDBI bank came through and gave us an ad hoc line, unsecured ad hoc line to a fraudulent company. Uh, it is amazing how we got that, but it was done in a very short time. We could pay salaries 
and regain the confidence of the... Uh, and the final was conclusion. We all were of the view that we should get the hell out as soon as possible. And we have to find a process, a process that is transparent, a process that is, uh, that is uh, chaired by a Supreme Court judge who will and divide the bids into two parts, technical qualification and financial. So first we opened the tech, and there were some people who would not qualify in that. And then we opened the financial bids. And Mahindra and Mahindra were the largest bidder. And so he handed over the company and walked out. I'm curious, what did the Prime Minister say when he called you? No, Prime Minister said that, please help us out. And it's such a soft voice, and we've known him for years, you couldn't say no. No one can say no to our ex-Prime Minister. So how did, you take, how did you take time out? Given no, I had to go to Hyderabad. Chairman Practically every, every week we were in Hyderabad, every week. And the weekends also, and two, three days there and come back. And so we had to stay there. And uh, fortunately, uh, the, the group worked very cohesively together. Mm -hmm. And someone handled the banking, someone handled customers, someone handled the, client, uh, the employees. And so we divided our work. We did not sit separately. The key was to sit in one room. Okay. So we sat in the boardroom of Satyam, and we got Shardul and Pallavi to help us as lawyers. We got Homi, uh, who is a well-known Homi, and uh, one other person, Partho Datta, to advise us, because they were both CEOs of companies. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to take my secretary there, because we couldn't trust anyone to write minutes. <laughs> So we had to do things like that, and, um, and we managed to do it. And it was, uh, we felt very satisfied at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Karnik, you chaired the first uh, board meeting. Uh, the chairman was appointed subsequently. So in that first board meeting, uh, what actually happened? Uh, first, Sandeep, uh, with your permission, let me congratulate the authors on a great book. It's a true page turner, mm -hmm. quite apart from the fact that I'm a biased reader, mm -hmm. but I think it genuinely is. Uh, Sandeep, I'd rather not talk too much about what transpired within the boardroom, but I want to go to some of the broader things that we learned as a result of that. And some of them Deepak mentioned, some Montek has mentioned. Just want to add a couple of other things. Uh, when this first happened, I must also say that I knew Raju for a long time before all this happened, and so it's a... And the work he did, which was outstanding, I was associated in some way with this 108, the Emergency Management Center, so I'd known him earlier, and was therefore probably more shocked than anybody else at the turn of events. Literally on January 6th, I would have given him a certificate on stamp paper saying this is a guy of good character and integrity. Truly, that would be my stand. So it came as a real shocker to me. And the first few days when this was happening, a number of people spoke to me. And uh, you know, I added my small voice to two things because I found there were two groups. And uh, Montek would know better. He may or may not say it within the government. One group was the mistrust business, the all crooks kind, who said, shareholders, all over the world it happens, and remember these were the post-liberalization, post-91 days, companies come and go, companies not done well, there's a fraud, they're closed on, hell with it. Another, another group said 50,000 employees, matter of India's pride and IT industry, not just IT industry, but post-2008, investment in India, people feel that governance here is good, so we need to do something, and therefore let's nationalize it. The other extreme, you might say, I mean not say left or right, but that's it. And then, therefore, it was you know, a number of people who are very influential, Montek is here, others, who I think saw good sense in saying, no, let's take a different path. I wouldn't say a middle path, a different path from these two, and see what can we do to revive the company. And to me, it's been a story of you know, not just rebuilding and doing it, but the story of India's resilience. The fact that when there's a crisis, if we can pull together, you can do wonders. And if is a big if, but I think this was shown truly to me, and that's the broader event. The other broad thing which comes from this pulling together, which Deepak mentioned too, is looking at the total ecosystem. And as he mentioned, just for that organization, we had to look at customers, employees. If one would leave, the other would leave too. If customers left, employees say, no future in this company. If employees start leaving, customers are going to say, hey, who's going to do my work? So you had to do that. Other parties involved, apart from the government, and I, I must, uh, again, with a biased view, give you some credit to NASCOM. As Deepak mentioned, those natural poaching tendencies of customers. But they tried hard, NASCOM, to make sure the poaching of employees is minimal. I wouldn't say it doesn't take place, but minimal. And that helped us, because we were able to assure customers that, hey, the team which has delivered work to you, and which you've been so satisfied with, is yet there. 
And please don't call it a satyam scam. And this to me was probably my own biggest failure, having dealt with the media any number of times, that I was not able to pursue the media to avoid this very tempting alliteration of satyam scam. That and call it Raju scam, if you please. it wasn't satyam gate. The gate part came later. <laughs> that came later. But satyam scam was bad enough. You know, I said, call it a Raju scam if you want. Call it something else. But don't degrade the company, the organization, the people. And then, of course, we all work together at doing all kinds of things there, including holding the employees and persuading them that, you know, you're back to the wall, let's fight back. Mm -hmm. And I think that so worked. So the, the, the motivation. interface with employees, the clients, obviously, you dealt with them separately. And as Mr. Parik mentioned, most of them were in the US, so that needed to be done in the night. But how did you deal with the employees, the 50,000 of them? Uh, did you, obviously, you couldn't call them individually. So what was done to allay their fears? Well, we did a few town halls, but I'll leave it to you know, Manoran to speak more about it. He did a lot of the employee interfacing because he spent far more time than any of us other board members in Hyderabad, and he did a lot of that. But you know, a lot of it also came from the confidence of what the board was able to do in putting together not only the government support, but people like Shardul and Pallavi, people like Homi, who's here, want to acknowledge his contribution, and Partho, getting people like BCG, Boston Consulting Group, to come and give. The employees saw that a lot of things are happening which are moving on. The money has come into the bank, salaries are being paid, the PF is being paid, which can land you in jail, as you know, otherwise. So I think that brought a sense of confidence. And then the continuous contact with them. The big thing there, and I do want to mention this, that while the employees were phenomenal in what they did, we had a problem because we didn't know who was involved. On day one, when we went there, we didn't know how far down the line this extends and who are the people from senior management who may be directly involved. So whom do you trust? What do you do? And I think we made some good judgments there in finding out who would be a reasonable person to take charge because we wanted an internal person to take charge and we did find one. Mm. Mr. Das, you've dealt with industrialists, businessmen nearly all your life. Mr. Karnik just mentioned that I would have given him a certificate on the morning of January 6th when this thing broke. Uh, was he, I've also met him a couple of times, I always found him too smooth, too glib. Was that your sense? Did you? In your, in your dealings or in your with him, how how can a man keep that side of himself? Uh, how can he not reveal his true game face? And when he did, it brought the house down. You know, he was a quiet man. Uh, he was not a voluble person. And uh, I remember once uh, he and I were traveling from New York to Delhi together. And, uh, but he, he, he didn't say much, you know. So one would definitely see him as someone very deep. And uh, he kept his thoughts to himself. And uh, as, as has been mentioned by Kiran, uh, there was um, another side to him, which was the social side, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of uh, very uh, useful work that he had initiated. But uh, if you will let me, I want to talk about one other aspect. Please. You've heard about the Prime Minister uh, making the call, uh, and you've heard from Montek about uh, his role in that. The first point that comes through came through to us at that time is that we were trusted. We were trusted to do something quite incredible. Now, in all my life, working life in CII, and many of my former colleagues are here, we worked to earn trust. Trust doesn't come to you. Right? So we worked to earn trust. And I think uh, the then Prime Minister felt that in this group of people, he could give trust to deliver you know, the task. That was one. Second, while Montague uh, truthfully said that he disappeared from the scene, but the Prime Minister, having appointed the board, went in for serious heart surgery. And, uh, and he said to us that uh, if you need anything, then go to Mr. Pranab Mukherjee. 
So I'm going to talk about a couple of anecdotes of that time. Sure, sure. Um, he was Minister for External Affairs at that time. And uh, there were huge challenges. We were in a black hole, and, and you have got the sense of that. The first challenge was that was all of government trusting us? Or did different parts of government look at this whole exercise differently? Um, did they really believe that we would deliver? What is that delivery, by the way? You know? And uh, it was necessary to get everyone to support the board from the government of India. And uh, Mr. Mukherjee at that time was chairing cabinet meetings, the senior most minister, and uh, gave access immediately whenever there was need to talk to him about Satyam issues. And he cleared the path with other ministries. How he did it, what he did, I don't think a circular went out but I'm sure a phone call or a conversation happened. The second time that one had to go to him for help was uh, the state government of Andhra Pradesh. They were also shattered. So suddenly, something had happened. Uh, but we needed data, we needed papers, we needed information, need all of that. And the normal tendency at that time is to say, who are these guys? You know six private sector guys asking for all kinds of information, confidential information. He cleared the path there also. And the third uh, time that one had to trouble him particularly, and uh, my colleagues have referred to it, was that when we were making calls to international customers, we had divided up the international customers amongst ourselves, I remember one uh, $40 million customer of Satyam telling me, don't talk to me, you know, I don't want to deal with a fraudulent company. And I mean, I'm saying that, you know, that group is gone. This is a new board, government managed. He says, no way, you know, we are out. And that was very critical to us to keep customers there, as you've heard. So one went again back to Mr. Mukherjee okay. for help. And uh, he put one of his most senior colleagues to work with us uh, to meet high commissioners and ambassadors of countries and say, the government is behind this group of people who are trying to turn this company around. So will you please ask your companies in your country to be patient? If this doesn't work, you do what you want, but give us a little time because this is a very important endeavor that we have embarked on. So it was a partnership, you know. Uh, it was a great partnership and it was a partnership of trust. How, they trusted how, us. How many such ambassadors and high commissioners did you did the group meet? Well, as, as you've heard, many of the customers are from the US. Uh, there were some very big customers from uh, Europe, uh, UK, Australia, etc. So, quite a few. Quite All these few. meetings took place in Delhi, obviously. Obviously, yeah. yeah. I, and we were not part of those meetings. And that was held between... between uh, okay, government and... These between people. government and... Okay. Uh, so basically, government, Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, so, the government did play a major role. It, uh, it carried they on definitely a role. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They supported us. And so, uh, when... Um, well, I look back. I said it was a great help at a very critical time mm -hmm. to us as we went forward. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shroff, uh, from a corporate legal standpoint, uh, this is the age of forensic audits, NPAs, NCLT. 2008 was completely different. Uh, what was the extent of malfeasance that you discovered once you were brought in? I think in the initial stages, it was not so much discovery of the malfeasance issues. What happened was that this two-stage appointment of the directors needed an extraordinary uh, uh, you know, protection because otherwise they would have been liable for continuing the wrong and not arresting it. 
which they could not have discovered in 15, 20 days. So some of the issues really pertain to the process. And I think it was more the accounting firms uh, like Deloitte and KPMG who actually did the forensics, did the analytics, and they discovered uh, the, uh, the wrongs. Since Raju had himself declared the amount, we were already working towards discovering that quantum of uh, fraud. And uh, one fine day, it was a Eureka kind of uh, discovery where they found he used to mark H and S on his suspect transactions. And having found that, they unraveled the whole uh, secret. What did H and S stand for? Hide and show. Oh. H is hide, S is show. When you click the so button. the construct of the scam was simple. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was. Simple as yeah. Yeah. But it was fraudulent accounting for the reason that there were no, no customers and yet they were shown as uh, income of the company, which is something which is still going on in dispute with the tax. And there were issues where there was much more income shown, much more deposits shown. So it was, a, it was basically driven by his instinct to be one of the big four. Mm -hmm. That was what was okay. the false pride, effectively, okay, okay. which drove him to do this. Mm -hmm. But uh, tell me, uh, are you, as a corporate lawyer of preeminence, are you happy with the criminal inv investigation and where it has gone and what has happened? I think my most, uh, you know, if I was to rate what I am happiest about, is that in 100 days, you could turn around a massive organization like Satyam and hand it over to a new promoter. When you look at, for example, the IBC, you have a 330 days process. And even that 330 days process is invariably uh, extended because it just doesn't happen. This story is actually about intent in many ways, honest belief that good administrators, good thinkers, good corporate people can, using their intellect, using their connections, using their contacts, could turn around a company of this magnitude. And all these people were working pro bono. None of them charged. So I think that was also a very major factor in the trust issue that happened because there was no pecuniary interest that any one of them had. And I think the most significant thing which I derive from this particular lesson is, see the people who were selected. You had the chairman of uh, NASCOM, so you took care of the IT industry. You had Mr. Achutan, who was a securities law expert, and this was a listed company. Then you had Mr. Deepak Parekh, who was the banking expert and had deep connections in the banking world. You had Mr. Manoharan, who was uh, involved in the institute, so accounts-related issues he could easily uh, resolve. You had Mr. Tarun Das, who was deeply involved with CII, and his co business connections, his government connections were uh, amazing. And then you had the sixth person who represented LIC as a shareholder. So you had carved out a board or made a board which had specialists, which rarely happens in a governmental action. This was not one of the ordinary exercises which has taken place. Somebody had clearly applied his mind in selecting these six people. And a lot of the effort that we had to support as the legal firm was actually taken care of because we didn't have to explain. Mm -hmm. They just knew. All that we really added to the picture is how to protect these six gentlemen. So we took an unprecedented indemnity order from uh, the CLB, which is still unprecedented. Not many get it, except in the ILFS case it has happened, but otherwise, no. Then issues in terms of how the process was uh, handle how the government really supported. We have Mr. Shuri here, who was representing uh, the government uh, in terms of its litigative process. He used to appear uh, for the government and carry out the instructions. Managing the process with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, 
uh, where continuous reporting had to take place. So every event which took place in the company law board had to be documented and you know, you'd go and meet the Secretary Ministry of Corporate Affairs, tell him the whole process. So there was a very, very articulated, precise process, and there were legal hurdles. This was an unprecedented action, as Mr. Parekh and Montekji have mentioned, that this third option of really neither letting the company sink nor nationalizing it, but putting in management in the hope that you will revive, had no precedent in India. So all these first uh, issues, and the, the chairman of the company, uh, uh, the company law board then, was also a phenomenal, uh, you know, he had phenomenal foresight. And actually, this was more like a sore motor action by him. Mm -hmm. The first order was really by him. There was, there was a governmental intimation, but how to do it was his genius. Mm -hmm. Mr. Aluvalia, uh, the board was reconstituted over two weeks. There was a first set and then a second set. The names, you mentioned Mr. Parikh's name. The names came from you uh, or the Prime Minister and other members of the government were also? Well, this is back to Rashomon again, because I can tell you what I knew. Uh, in my discussions with the PM, I had suggested the names of uh, Deepak and also Tarun and uh, Kiran. But we also felt that you know we needed a legal expert. I can't remember whether I mentioned Shardul or it came up as a result of discussion. Achutan was the person who was selected. Okay, so then uh, uh, after that, I don't know. I'm sure the PM would have consulted a few other people, and maybe also the uh, the, the new uh, board that was uh, identified, and that's how it actually happened very quickly. But the, you see, the critical decision. The most important decision was that there would not be a single representative of a government there. Uh, and that's what made it unique. Because otherwise, taking it over, nationalizing it, etc., I mean, the thing would have been a disaster. True. Mr. Parikh, uh, the 100-day agenda, uh, was that laid down very quickly that we need to do this uh, if there is a timeline attached to closing? No, the 100 days came about, but we were at it from day one. And uh, I must say that we got the uh, utmost cooperation from the government, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Secretary uh, Anurag Goel, uh, Pranab Mukherjee was the acting prime minister, was accessible to us. Sebi, Sebi really bent backwards to help us. Chandu Bhave was there as chairman. IDBI gave us an unsecured line uh, just on our assurance that we will keep it safe and we hope to give it back. It was just, so it was, it was the um, total support of government we Absolutely. worked with and um, that, that's how we could do it in a short period of time. And none of us wanted to stay there long mm -hmm. and we were there for a short, short uh, stay and uh, our objective from day one is to get over it as fast as we can. And, but I would say the state government support, we never met any bureaucrats or any politicians of the state government. Okay. We stayed away and they stayed away from us. Because obviously Raju must be very close to the chief minister and the powers that be in the state. Ensured that. Yeah, so, so somehow we, we stayed away from them. They never well asked to, uh, we never asked to meet them. They never called us, they never interfered. And, um, and, and so we were, fortunate to have like-minded people who had the same objective to get out of Hyderabad as soon as possible. And, uh, and that's how it worked. 100 days, it happened 100 days. Okay. Mr. Manoran, you, you, you were the president of the Indian Chartered Accountants uh, Association. You were roped in by MCA and the PMO uh, to coordinate the whole thing. So as, as the coordinator, uh, how did you view this entire yeah. uh, event? You know, Satyam, uh, when we walked in, you know, as a chartered accountant during student days, Deepak Ji will agree, he's also a chartered accountant of England and Wales. We used to debate whether accounting is an art or a science. Only after entering Satyam, I realized it could be a fiction. <laughs> because many things were not uh, bona fide. I think global financial crisis triggered the cr uh, calamity for Raju. The orders were dwindling. Liquidity crunch was staring large at his face. Mm -hmm. 
And it, Satyam was unique on two counts. One is it is not a case of investigation leading to confession. It was confession <laughs> triggering investigation. Second thing is it was a turnaround not using taxpayers' money, unlike US, mm. which is legislated to pump in taxpayers' money to revive uh, many of the banks and uh, you know, uh, organizations. So when we walked in, we, uh, Mr. Anurag Goyal, Secretary of Ministry of Corporate Affairs, called me and spoke to me. And uh, the mandate, as I could uh, recollect, was very clear. This government-nominated board should segregate the good from the bad. Like the company is good, employees are good, customers are good, India's reputation and stakeholders. So you work to preserve this. The bad, whoever has committed the fraud, the investigating agencies, law enforcing agencies will take care. So with that clarity, we plunged in. And as my distinguished uh, colleagues on the government nominated board, in fact, they were the face of the board. You know, Deepak ji, Karan ji, Tarun ji, you know, they were legendary personalities. Their goodwill helped us a lot. So therefore, when we plunged into revival operation, we got absolute cooperation from the employees. In fact, some of them came and said, we don't want variable pay. You, we are willing to forego. But we said, no, we will not default on a single payment. We'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, customers initially were reluctant. But later, you know, they agreed on a wait and watch mode. We'll give you some weeks of time. If everything goes fine, we'll support you. Otherwise, we'll pull our, I mean, uh, terminate our contracts. Mm -hmm. In fact, the transparent approach helped. You know, and that strategy was coming from, you know, uh, all the senior members on the board. We assured all the foreign clients, overseas clients, Europe, America, everywhere, that please wait and watch for a few weeks. If everything goes fine, you support us. If you want to terminate, don't do it behind our back. You tell us, we will help you to migrate to another service provider. Even if competitor doesn't have the bandwidth to service your project, we will rebadge our employees on your payroll. Mm. This, I think, you know, infused trust and confidence on the board. Mm. So therefore, they stayed with us and supported us. And that's how, you know, uh, we could uh, tie the loose ends in terms of customers. Employees' motivation was a major task. As Karanji was mentioning, you know, we told them, we are nobody for Satya. We are strangers. At the instance of government, we have come in. But you are what you are because of Satyam. And this is the time the company needs you. So join hands with the government nominated board, turn it around, few months down the line, we can look back and celebrate. Then you migrate wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. I think that clicked and uh, they worked along with us. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Das, as a, oh, yeah, sure. I just wanted to say it was a real failure of the chartered accountants um, who were auditing uh, Satyam. Because, you know, you normally check bank balances. They showed a statement that HDFC had 380 crores with us. We had zero. And they had a, a fraud, fraudulently printed HDFC letterhead. And um, the auditors didn't go behind it and ask for reconciliation or statements from the bank. And it was so obvious that the logo of our bank was also on the wrong side of the letterhead. So it was that blatant. And the auditors obviously did not pay any heed to it, did not confirm balances. And so it's a collusion, of effort of my, collusion, my, I'm sure it is. My follow-up question was, well, I was I'm going to ask you on this uh, exact subject. The independent directors, there was a board. It was a listed company. There were independent directors. There was an audit committee. And now you're saying that they'd actually printed and forged a letterhead. So what was going on inside? Because the, the con man is a self-professed con man. He, he claimed that he had done this. But what about the rest of the ecosystem? What were they doing? What, what is it that you discovered, Mr. Parikh, as far as the independent directors, the audit committee, the auditors? No, they were all rubber stamps. They agreed with whatever he did. They did not question him. They did not uh, do anything, and including his senior employees. And I'm sure they were well paid and looked after, so they carried on. You know, we found a Bank of Baroda account in, in New York, because the receipts from US companies were going to Bank of Baroda in the New York branch. We found here two accounts in New York branch. One is personal and one is Satyam account. And uh, so, you know, it was a total failure of accountant, staff, board, and probably a total collusion, at least with the, some critical staff members 
with the auditors. I think uh, directors are the last people who find out if there's a fraud. <laughs> uh, Mr. Das, uh, the emergent financial crisis that uh, you walked headlong into, I think the salary, the wage bill was 500 crores. And uh, some of you have mentioned that IDBI, of course, gave you a line of credit. But how is it that these payments were, were made? Uh, contractual obligations, clients, employees, uh, a wage bill which needed to be dealt with every month. How is this done? Basically because banks helped us out, you know, as, as Mr. Parik has said. Um, I also just want to refer to your question about uh, independent directors. They didn't know because what they were being presented were false accounts. See, whatever the staff concerned, working with the auditors, presented, they took it at face value. Of course, the chairman knew, chairman of the company but knew. But this carried on for years. I don't know whether it carried on for years or maybe for a year, because as Mr. Manohoran has said, the 2008 financial crash precipitated. 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 And this has happened in 2009, you know. So I would say that uh, that was the issue. and. We were able to get help. The, the point I made in my first set of remarks is that how could we achieve all this? We, we also got a lot of help, mm -hmm. you know? Whether it's a Pranam Mukherjee or it's a bank who gave us unsecured uh, money uh, or SEBI who went out of its way or the company law board uh, chairman you know, you've got a whole ecosystem of people. At that point of time, everybody came together and said, let's save Satyam. Mm -hmm. And we saved Satyam. So it, it, it was an amazing uh, teamwork going beyond the six of us. Mm -hmm. uh, a whole lot of other people supported uh, us. Mr. Karnik, uh, I think the government mandate, if I remember right, was that don't go into the past. Cut the umbilical cord. Look at what can be done to salvage this operation. Was that the mindset? Uh, you know, I hesitate a bit, uh, Sadeep, because we didn't have such a very clearly stated mandate. I think it's something which we discussed and we said, look, this makes sense. So even the investigating agencies, as Mr. Manoran said, we sort of told them that, look, you look, you investigate, which is the past fraud. We, we are taking off from here to make sure the company goes well. So we sort of drew a line roughly in our minds there. But obviously, when you go to sell the company, you need past accounts. I just want to add two things to, to your earlier question and, you know, uh, maybe I'm fair a bit on what uh, Tarun just said. You know, it's easy to blame the directors and they have to take some responsibility. But look, when a big four audit company certifies everything, when the same company gets year after year governance awards done with a proper jury, with mm. due diligence, then there's no reason why the independent, <coughs> sorry, directors should have any doubts. But there are two points that I learned from there which I've been pushing hard. See, we have this category of independent directors, mm -hmm. no relatives, et cetera, et cetera. But look, if a director's on the board for too long of the same company, Could how be. independent is the person? No, I'm not talking of collusion. I'm just saying you learn to trust the person. If you've known the chairman for years and years, it's part of our culture. You don't want to disagree publicly with, with him too much. Mm -hmm. So you might raise a point, but not push it beyond that. And therefore, I think there's a danger, I mean, there's long-term lessons of governance, mm. that uh, independence should also be defined by number of years on the board. Not a new person necessarily be more independent, but the probability is greater than a person who's been there and knows the chairman, knows the management for 15 years, and is continuing on the board. You tend to trust them, they're good. And to me, that's what happened. Excellent people, independent directors on the board, I mean, mm. very eminent people, I know some of them, and you know, I, I don't in the least bit suspect any cohesion whatsoever. And not even quite fully turning a blind eye, except the last few months maybe when long story, a different one of the Meta's merger came up and then you asked earlier a question of Raju and you know somebody told me that uh, this is the cultural feeling where you do anything for your sons. Your sons are running Meta's. I have no idea. I won't get into that. But you know, I think there are deeper things in there. Uh, Mr. Shroff, uh, uh, Mr. Karnik mentioned lessons. Do you think uh, corporate India, the entire ecosystem I'm talking about, independent directors, auditors, chartered accountants, the people who are involved in the process of business. Do you think we've learned lessons from 
Satyam over the last 13 years? I, I, I think we've got progressively worse. See, the, 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 the lessons were clear in the sense that the Companies Act 213 is actually called the Satyam Companies Act. Okay. Because everything which was discovered and which had an adverse effect was protected by the law. You had a class action in the US, you introduced class action in the Companies Act. You had auditors rotation come about, it is there. The issue of independent directors and the time limit, it is there. So all the issues which were considered ills mm -hmm. of Satyam have found their place in the Companies Act to annul those wrongs, mm -hmm. to, to defeat those kind of issues. So yes, there were clear lessons uh, that were learned, but that is no answer to the fact that when people want to do a fraud, they will. Mr. Barak, you've uh, been a banker all your life and uh, I think uh, HDFC uh, has managed to carve a name for itself in terms of corporate governance. It's one of the bywords. How do you view this? Uh, all that has happened over the last 13 years, particularly what has happened over the last five, six years. <coughs> Zillions of companies going into NCLD, all sorts of people indulging in open fraud, creative fraud, See, greed is something you can't control. The, the stronger you are, the bigger you are, the, the amount involved gets higher and higher. You see it in US also, overnight billions of dollars are wiped out on a market cap and where thousands of investors are there. So basically the, the, the organization or the chairman or the CEO, they must have the individual conscience that they are working for stakeholders, they're working for shareholders and they are there because they are paid for it and they have to do a true and honest day's job. And uh, the independent directors are paid and I agree with uh, uh, the point made by Kiran that the lack of independence is there if you continue a director for more than 10 years or so. So in the Reserve Bank, they do not allow directors to continue more than 10 years, two terms of five years each. It's not there in the corporate, in the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, it's also there now. It's there but it, you know they've taken 10 years from now not historic 10 years. So, two terms, two terms of five years each. So you still have 10 years. It's not retrospective. It's not retrospective, it's prospective. So, so basically it is, um, the numbers are getting more, the persons are getting more greedy. Uh, collusion is the main reason. One person cannot do it. It has to be collusion. Um, and we've seen number of companies go down that way and people have lost money and confidence, whether it's the financial sector or, uh, you know, banks and NBFCs and housing companies and so many companies have gone under, leasing companies, all their raw material is cash. That's where the problem starts. They siphon off the cash for the personal benefit, for the personal use. So Gordon Gecko was right. Greed is good. <laughs> Control greed and you'll stop all the frauds. <laughs> Mr. Aluwal, you wanted to add something. No, I just wanted to comment on the, you know, the issue was raised about independent directors. And I think rightly pointed out that, you know, an independent director can only go by the chartered accountant's report. I mean, he's not meant to start going behind that to see whether the chartered accountant did a good job. Uh, the interesting thing is that in this particular case, it clearly the chartered accountants did a bad job and probably willfully they were punished. I understand two of the relevant mm -hmm. partners went to jail. Yes. And I think it was Price Waterhouse. I don't know if I'm violating any yes. secrets. Price Waterhouse was debarred mm. from taking any other new assignments for a period of two years. For so, listed hmm? for listed for listed for okay. Oh, I see. Okay. That's an interesting point, too. Um, now, you know, clearly, uh, what, what one wants to know is that is that punishment? Uh, both for the individual's concern and for the chartered accountants, uh, the firm, is that going to lead to greater due diligence within the chartered accountants firm, you know, to avoid collusion? Because after all, it's the job of the firm to make sure that there isn't collusion. So those kinds of issues, I don't think you can do more than that. Because, but in this whole chain, uh, the role of the chartered accountants and the effectiveness with which that role is play, uh, performed, and the discipline imposed by the firm itself, 
I mean, presumably it's affected by having been punished. You could argue that the punishment could have been more severe, mm. and maybe the next time around it should be. But I think those are important institutional developments, uh, which, I mean, hopefully will send the right sort of signal. But I agree with what Shardul said. I mean, you know, if people are absolutely determined to do something wrong, uh, you won't be able to stop them, but the system might throw up early warning signals earlier uh, than otherwise. I mean, that's all you can actually say. They're very much like suicide bombers. Hmm? Yeah. They're very much like suicide bombers. <laughs> so the December board meeting was actually the trigger for all this collapse. Mm -hmm. What happened was the proposal, as Mr. Karnik mentioned, uh, of merger of Metas with, uh, mm -hmm. with Satyam was brought to the board. And there were objections raised at the meeting by one of the directors. Though they smelt, they didn't, I mean, it, instinctively they understood that this is not kosher. They all agreed. And the reaction on the US markets was a complete collapse. So because of the complete collapse in the US market, they abandoned the process. Now this itself was a indication Red that flag. something is wrong. Red flag was nobody. Why did you? Why? Anything. Why were you talking of merging a real estate company okay. with an IT company? Okay. I mean, it was a bizarre proposal, and that's what really triggered the whole collapse. In Hindi, it's called putra prem. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Raman, uh, it was said that you had great clarity of thought uh, when you wrote this narrative or this treatise. What made you uh, write this book? Obviously, it's a fascinating subject, corporate fraud, uh, man riding a tiger, refusing to get off, etc., etc. So give us uh, your perspective on why you did this and how you wrote these chapters even before they were commissioned. Uh, the way that I looked at Satyam generally, yeah, I, I, I always thought that Satyam had three faces. Mm -hmm. Phase one was before Raju wrote about his famous tiger, writing the tiger story. That's a very storied story. Everybody knows mm -hmm. about how, how he grew, what he did. The other part is what happened after Tech Mahindra. A remarkable turnaround, everything has happened. My own view was that that 100 days in between was actually or continues to be the most significant development in the entire story. And my personal view was was that continues to be that that's a story that is going to get forgotten. It's a story that will become a blip in the radar. Today, if you ask the young chartered accountants or any of the 30-something people, uh, they will remember Raju, but they would not remember the phenomenal kind of work that these six board members did. And I'm not saying that because Mr. Manor is a good friend of mine. It was a remarkable thing. I personally, for example, when Satyam happened, I said, this is the time to get out of the stock. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way it was turned around, six people fight, fighting it out, a government standing by, by the side, and like all of them said, government standing away from it and getting it to run. I thought this is a classic business story that needs to be said. Even, even, even if it is 12 years later, it's a story that needs to be told. That is the background in which uh, Mr. Manoran and I began writing this. Yeah, but you, uh, it was said that you wrote it without anything being commissioned. You, you we we knew somebody will take it. it it's a story. No, you, you go and tell that we will write along with Manoran, you know, with Manoran's, Mr. Manoran's background. People say, okay, come, let us see. So once it is done, you go and say, here is a story. Do you want to take it? If Rupa had said, or Rupa had never said no, but if Rupa had said no, we would have gone to somebody else. Uh, Mr. Karnik. Okay, Mr. Aluwale. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, I'm too tempted by my own suggestion earlier that they should make it into a film. So I want to bring out the kind of uh, more interesting side of it, right? Uh, the book makes a very interesting point, by the way, that all the disputes uh, abroad that arose because of Satyam's misdemeanors were settled within a year. The ones inside are still going on. So I think somebody, somebody who is responsible for ease of doing business and you know what we're doing about our legal system uh, somehow should think that what the hell is going on here the other and a very interesting point uh, which I think one of the I think it was Deepak who pointed out 
that, you know, the, uh, whenever some wrongdoing is done, the dominant concern, let me just burn turn this off. The dominant concern in the government is to make sure that you found the wrongdoers mm. and stop wrongdoing. Doesn't matter what collateral damage you cause, right? Mm. So they were really terrified because the income tax, the first reaction was attach all the bank accounts. Mm. Okay. Now, <laughs> if they attack, if the whole idea is to keep the company going, then attaching the bank accounts would be a disaster. Yeah. They managed to persuade the finance minister that, look, uh, you can't, uh, don't do that because then the whole company will collapse. And he was, Dr. Mr. Mukherjee, he was not only finance, he was then external affairs, but also acting mm. prime minister, since the prime minister was not. So they took care of that problem. They didn't attach the bank accounts. The other interesting thing, I think it's mentioned, or one of them told me, that the income tax authorities had a very interesting take on these events. Because Satyam had wrongly asserted all kinds of earnings, which didn't exist. Mm. But income tax said, for the purpose of income tax, we're going to assess you for tax on these earnings. Mm. So the huge tax demand, okay? According to Deepak, this is still going on. The interesting thing is that whereas the finance minister could take action that, look, don't attach accounts, uh, the finance minister actually has no power to alter an income tax assessment by an assessing officer. Uh -huh. Because the system is there's a process of appeal. So political interference doesn't come in the way. I mean, unless you've somehow persuaded the income tax officer not to do it, if he's done it, in all honesty, Nobody can, even the finance minister or the prime minister can't reverse it. So it's an interesting point that that thing is still going on. So, you know, when we talk about uh, some of the lessons of Satyam are that here was a terrific rescue orchestrated by these gentlemen. The government can only claim credit that they allowed them to orchestrate it and didn't nationalize it, very important. But there's a lot of lessons about some of the absurd things that happen and somebody should be thinking about what we might do in future to prevent that. Mm -hmm. uh, post facto, Mr. Parekh, uh, uh, the Meta's merger, uh, everybody red flagged it. People knew something was amiss. There was a sense that something was amiss. The stock market gave an indication. Do you think SEBI was proactive at that particular point in time? Because post facto, SEBI, of course, stepped in. But do you think SEBI, and, and I, I don't, say this only for Satyam. Over the last several years, we've seen scams after scams after scams with listed companies. And do you think SEBI is doing enough? Did it do enough then? Is it doing enough now? No, at least for Satyam, they went out of their way. But post and, and No, no, before. Even before. before because uh, even the process of uh, how to go ahead and uh, number of things they helped us legally. Uh, Shardul may be able to tell us. Chandu Bhave was the chairman and he understood um, he understood that this was necessary and Mr. Achutan, who unfortunately no longer with us, he was an ex-SEBI person, so he knew the rules which laws had to be exempted mm -hmm. under which section. And between Achutan and Shardul, we got all the exemptions pre also, before we found Mahindra and Mahindra. And there were quite a few people who were interested in the company, but the m and bid was the highest. Uh, yeah. What uh, Mr. Parekh said was that in any change of control or takeover of a listed company, you would have to make a public offer. Hmm. The regulations of the SEBI takeover code contemplated an average of a six months weighted average. Weighted average. Yeah. Now, all those accounts were fraud. They were disclaimed by the accounting people. So how will you go and make an offer? Mm -hmm. That is where SEBI helped us to actually say that in the event of a fraud, those will not be taken into consideration and you can make it like an auction sale, okay. which is what was done. done. Okay. Mr. Karnik, uh, obviously there was a process as we've heard from all the panelists and the process by itself took over. But if there was one silver bullet, what was that silver bullet? Pranam I, Mukherjee? I, 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 yeah, I, I was about to say that, that if you ask me for just one, I think frankly it's him because you know we needed all the support from surrounding, lots of credit is being given to the board and, you know, my other colleagues did a <coughs> humongous amount of stuff on it. But as I said earlier, it was a total ecosystem and a large part of that was the government. Mm -hmm. And it was people in the government, one of them right here, 
but at the highest level it was really Mr. Pranam Mukherjee and you know always there and thanks to Tarun we had complete access to him and I can tell you just one one additional thing to, to what was said about some anecdotes there you know towards the close of the 100 day period the company had stopped, we had customers were there employees had stayed on money was working there, things were business was going there and suddenly I know many people again I, I won't ask Mr. Alvaya to comment on it but there were many people in government saying hey now what's the hurry? Wait for a year, let's look at what the value is, let's look at what the market is, why do you want to get out now? So then stay on, you know, the tendency to say, no hurry. And we said nothing doing. And I remember one meeting where Mr. Pranam Mukherjee was there, and uh, Tarun might recall that, where we were trying to tell him why we were in a hurry to sell. And I think what clinched the argument was the analogy. You know, he listened to all the, sort of, you might say, economic and technical arguments. Uh, but what clinched it was the analogy of telling him, look, when you have fruit in the market, they have value today. Tomorrow, they may have as much or more value. But day after tomorrow, you can't sell them for junk. Yeah. So, we've got to act now. And somehow, I could see the twinkle in his eye. And that did it. So, if you ask me for one silver bullet, there'd be many, but it was that. The other one I do want to mention, though, is something on the trust side. Very important, because trust not in us as the board, but also the trust that we're able to engender both in employees and customers. For example, on customers, you ask the question about money and the banks. One thing that helped us a great deal was, I remember at least a few customers whom we talked to, we were able to persuade them that instead of your normal 30-day payment period, can you please pay us in two weeks, or, thir or three weeks, pay us a little earlier. And so we were able to round up some money from customers who seemed reasonably satisfied and keep that. So that was because they trusted whatever you call it, the board, the government's backing, or the Satyam team that was with them. But the trust factor is critical. And the trust now is eroding. And one of the concerns, broader again, is that you know trust in business, I think, was down True. for many, many years. Then there was a new wave of companies which were, by and large, middle class values. Frankly, the IT industry, if I can take some, again, a biased view on that, brought some trust back, saying, hey, business is not all bad. But I fear that, again, the trust level in business is decreasing, barring a few big known names. If you talk to a common person somewhere, or in the government, if you, these guys are a bit, you know, not crooks, but uh, you know, watch them, they're cutting corners. Mm -hmm. And uh, without trust, these things won't work. And whether it's the individual level of integrity and ethics or companies and the trust they engender in society in general, that's the thing to worry about. Mr. Das wanted to add something. I just want to leave uh, everybody with some images of what we went through. One, constantly flying into Hyderabad. <laughs> You know, repeated flights to Hyderabad, repeated flights to Hyderabad in those 100 days. Second, when we met, we met and we met and we met till midnight. We were working till midnight. Third, Shardul and Pallavi and their team who were with us day in and day out all the time. Can you do this? Can we do this? Can we not do this? Are we going to go to jail if we do this? Uh, and she would say to us, you know, this will lead to litigation, so you can't do this. You know, it was a continuous process. So I, this is, I, I remember this uh, very much. And then uh, fourth, uh, it's not, uh, he's left now, uh, Deepak, because he has to catch a flight to Bombay. Um, but he was a master. He was a master. To have Deepak Parikh there was amazing. So he is one of the greatest. That, and to have him there on that board, um, he, he is incredible. So India is lucky to have a man like him. We were lucky to have a man like him on the board. Uh, Mr. Alwali, uh, reputational damage is at the core of this uh, issue. Uh, it was not merely a Satyam or Indian tech. It was about us, India. So did that feeling envelope all of you uh, within the government or? Uh? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that was the only reason why I went up to Dr. Singh. And I mean, you know, the, de the deputy chairman of the planning commission is normally not supposed to be involved in or concerned with corporate fraud. But I felt this is a really big issue, and we can get it totally wrong. And he was very good. I mean, he saw the point. 
and gave very clear set of signals. And I think, well, I mean, I'm only repeating what everybody said. It's, you know, it's interesting that um, the government has learned because, I mean, the present government repeated this with the uh, ILFC. Yeah. Now, that's a different kind of uh, situation because that's a non-bank finance company, which has many other uh, implications. But faced with the problem, they didn't decide to nationalize it. They brought in a similar team with Uday Kotak uh, heading it. Uh, and I think that the success of the Satyam story um, had a lot to do with that particular decision. So, you know, that's, uh, it should be better known. And I'm delighted that this book, which is so punchily written, and hopefully the film that Rupa is going to make <laughs> after, will make it widely known. Uh, I'll, I would want all of you to make closing remarks, but I will ask Mr. Manohan first. Uh, I think for, for the board, uh, it was clearly articulated that you deal with salvaging yeah. this company and leave the bad to the enforcement agencies. So how was this, uh, this divorce that took place? How, how did you deal with this divorce? Yeah. Uh, actually, the focus was to bring the business on track. Only then, the value of Satyam will go up and in strategic investor will find it attractive to buy in, take over. And uh, I would say the major contribution came from employees. To validate this, let me give an anecdote. As I said, such customers said, we are willing to wait and watch, but you have to update us every week or fortnight. Follow-up calls, different time zones. As Karen said, I was there 24 by 7, taking these calls and answering all their questions. And whenever the call ended, was about to end, I said, you have asked me so many questions. I have only one question. And I asked every one of those customers towards the end of the conversation, how is the project del delivery? on-site, off-site, uniformly, every customer had to say only one thing. Before the fraud, it was good. Now it is the best. Which means that the employees have taken up to their heart that it's a do or die situation. And they put their heart and soul and gave timely quality delivery of service. That's why if you see in our book, we have dedicated to all the Satyamites who stood by the government board. So they contributed significantly and which also conveys a message to the larger corporate world, it's all in human resources. If human resources, the team can unite together and give their best, there is nothing that is impossible. So that's how I would like to indicate my learning. Mr. Das? Just to add to what uh, Manoran said, when we first went in, Satyam employees, because we were talking to them, listening to them, they were ashamed. And they were saying that my parents in the village, many of them from Andhra, they ashamed that we are working for a crooked company. And we felt we had to deal with that issue. We had to make them proud again. And that happened very quickly. And this is what you just heard. They worked their guts out. And they helped us to keep our commitment to the customers because we were saying at a macro level, stay with us for a little while. Yeah. And uh, that worked out very well. It was an honor to be there. You know, it was an honor to be there. It was an honor to be trusted. Uh, it was an, an amazing experience. Uh, I'm glad a book has been written many years later. Um, he, he's done a good job. Maybe he has to do a second edition. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Tell me, uh, obviously, Mahindra's was the highest bidder, but was there any dialogue with Mahindra's during that 100-day period, or was no. that completely separate? No. 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 Uh, see, the due process was followed. Mm -hmm. Expression of interest, inviting, all that happened. It started with some 140. Then we found many of them fictitious. <laughs> and then it came down to 10. Seven submitted, uh, yeah, seven submitted documents. Out of that, five were approved in their boards. Ultimately, three remained, two withdrew. So out of the three, it was Tech Mahindra, LNT, and uh, Wilbur Ross. And all the three were 
given a sh uh, like Homi and Parthwa, they made management presentations showcasing the assets, liabilities, hidden uh, litigation, claims, all those things. Transparent, everything is video recorded and no informa one information additionally given to one bidder was given to the other two also. So due process was followed, technical bid, all the three qualified, financial bid, Wilbur Ross quoted 20 rupees, LNT quoted 45.90, and TechMinder quoted 58 rupees. We had a clause which said if uh, the any bidder is within 90% of the highest bidder, among them there will be a rebidding to maximize the value. But unfortunately, 4590 was within not within 90% of 58. So TechMinder was declared as the successful bidder. Mr. Adwali, closing remarks. Well, huge compliments actually to the transparency of the bidding process. I mean, it's an interesting issue because, you know, bidding, th uh, auction theory has developed quite a bit. And one of the interesting things that I would want in the second edition uh, the authors should speculate about is would it have been better to have a, a recurring open auction? Uh, the, I don't know the answer, but they, what they did has worked beautifully. But it would be very nice to get from them in retrospect, would it have been better to do it that way? Uh, that would be relevant for the next time around when somebody handles a similar situation. Thank you. You know, take care from what Montek said. What he said worries me and you're recording it all. Somebody will blame us now for notional loss. Had we done that, you might have got 62 <laughs> rupees. So Montek, I'm worried now. Better get a, uh, <laughs> better go and get a bail. <laughs> no, I, I just want to add two things. One was, you know, what did help us, frankly, at least in all my interactions with all the customers outside the country was the respect for the Indian IT industry, IT talent in the country, and the governance. Fortunately, all our top companies, Satyam now excluded at that time, had a great reputation. TCS with the Tatas, Wipro with Azim Premji and the standards and values he had set, and Infosys, which was in many ways the best author of good governance. So we had a good standing, and that made it, in some sense, easier for us to win what I said earlier, the trust and so on. And I used that a great deal, unashamedly saying, you, you work with the Indian IT industry. Tell me, this is a one-off aberration. And it's an aberration of the promoter, not of the company. Your team is yet with you, as Manoran said. Tell me how the delivery has been so far. It's been great. So it will continue. If you have a problem, tell us. We'll transition you to somebody else. And that worked. But the end lesson is, you know, and again, I use this shamelessly after Satyam, whenever trying to sell the India story abroad, you say, look, every country has some company which is a black sheep. We won't deny that we have one, we may have others. And every country, every major country has gone through this. I tell my US friends who are our biggest customers for tech, saying, look, you went through Enron and so many others, I don't have to name them. But we are the only country that has salvaged it. We have come out of it with no problem to you, which is the customer, or to anybody else or the company. So the ability of India to recover from a crisis is something which we have proven, which you guys have not. And that's definitely a big, big plus. And I think that helps. Uh, before I go to Mr. Shroff, I just want to ask Mr. Das uh, one last question. Did that 40 million guy come back? Would you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Stayed. Stayed. He did? Of course. Yeah. We, we did not lose customers. Mr. Shroff? I think from my perspective as a lawyer advising uh, this professional board, of uh, you know, great eminence, was that uh, we assisted them, as uh, Tarunda mentioned, on examining the rights and the wrongs and what are the possible litigations that could emerge when this process was ongoing. And what satisfied me most was that there was no single litigation in the entire process of 100 days, and we carried it through. Nobody challenged the bona fides. Nobody challenged the. Uh, transparency of the process. Nobody even challenged the auction. Normally, you see what processes are happening. The moment somebody wins, there's a winner's curse. Yes. The, the second person will always challenge what the first person has won. In this case, I think because of the preeminence of the board and the process which had happened, which was really a private process rather than a public process, none of this happened. I think that is the most amazing story out of this. Today, if you see the uh, IBC, every decision which is taken in an is, is put up in appeal, which did not happen. IBC has 330 days. These guys did it in 100 days. 
I think the, 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 the examples are completely stark and you couldn't have got it better. 100 days to turn around a company of this size and this magnitude is, is outstanding by any count. I leave the last word uh, to Mr. Raman. Uh, no, I think sequels are very hard to write, uh, and uh, I would uh, I would personally believe that this is a massive story of yes we can, and as a writer I would like that a lot lot many people in India and abroad read this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I thank all the panelists for sharing their valuable insights. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you, everybody. With that, we come to a close of the session. I'd like to once again invite all of you to give a loud applause to all our panelists, and especially both the authors. Thank you very much. On behalf of CII and Rupa Publications, I thank the audience and the media for being here with us. And I think it has been a great, great, very revealing afternoon. I'd like to invite all of you to join us for high tea outside. Can we have a photo up, please, for everyone?